Um, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for staying here for the last session. Um, really excited to join the Cloud Native Summit. Uh, after my talk, um, we can have a Friday, to uh, Friday drink, so I'll try my best to end it on time. Um, yeah, so the topic, um, before I guess that, probably um, quickly introduce myself. Um, my name is Xiaodi. Um, I am a Microsoft MVP and uh, I work at Zero. So uh, Microsoft MVP is a uh, award for some uh, my, uh, community contributors. So if you are interested in this program, feel free to contact me after the session. I'm happy to answer any question about this program. Um, yeah, the topic of this summit um, is cloud native. Um, so as we said, um, we are seeing uh, lots of organizations uh, start uh, starts their um, digital transformation to cloud native. But what's a, what's a cloud native? Um, so I, I recall a couple of years ago, I, I had a chat with one of my colleagues. Um, his name is Thomas. Um, not sure Thomas still remember that, but um, we discussed something about um, whether the developer's work was easier or harder than before. Um, so Thomas said, um, developers now are like Lego players. Um, do you agree with that? So I think um, that's a good analogy, because uh, you think, um, I think, think, think back to maybe 15 years or 20 years ago, we had to maintain the servers, we had to uh, maybe, you know, how to install the IA server on uh, Windows. But now we have lots of uh, services and components in, in the cloud. Um, if you check the product category of any cloud provider, like Azure or AWS, you can find hundreds of different products in the cloud. Um, so it seems like these services are like Lego bricks, right? The developer just uh, assemble that and to build the application. Is it true? We can do a quick survey. Um, anyone thinks our work is easier than before? You can hands up. Very few. <laughs> so the other you, you think it's harder, right? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, it's kind of, actually it's quite complex, um, much complex than before. Um, why? So I'm not sure if you agree with this, this statement. So now the world is distributed. Um, I think more and more applications are, use, uh, are using the distributed or microservice architecture. Um, so, because today's topic is cloud native. I think today we don't have to explain too much about the benefits of distributed application or microservice, uh, microservice uh, architecture. Um, but I do have, um, one thing I do want to emphasize is that even though we have lots of tools or uh, components in the cloud, uh, we still have lots of challenges when we build the uh, uh, distributed application. Uh, so here is the example um, of the distribu uh, distributed microservice architecture. So you can see, um, I'm sure you, you have seen this kind of architecture uh, before. So there are some, um, uh, this, the application has been decomposed into different modules. And uh, each service has its own code, has its um, database or dependencies. So we can scale out each service separately. Um, so normally this kind of services are deployed in containers um, and managed by a container orchestrator. Um, so, but we, when we look at this kind of architecture, th there are some uh, challenges. So first, because um, we can scale out the service. So you might have multiple instances for each service. So how can we find it? How can we f uh, find where these services are and how can we check their health status? So this kind of some, uh, something like service discovery. Also, uh, this kind of service are uh, um, stateless, but sometimes, the service must maintain the state um, for some uh, business logic. For example, if you develop a shopping cart service, you must maintain the state, otherwise the user will lose their uh, shopping cart data. So we need a state management. Uh, also, you will notice that on the bottom, there's a event bus, obviously pop stop pattern, because you can better decouple uh, different modules. So we need a pop stop. Um, and uh, because this, application will be deployed in the cloud. When we access the resources in the cloud, we need to get the secret, right? So we need to find some way to manage the secret. So you can see there are some new challenges for our developers. So why it's more complex than before? So uh, the 
problem is even though we have um, lots of uh, tools or uh, uh, service in the cloud, but we still need to understand uh, which service we'll use. How can we write our code? How can we integrate the cloud service with our application, right? What if you want to migrate to another service, uh, another uh, cloud? Um, so there are some uh, questions here. Because um, when you write the code that targets to a specific cloud, that means your application will be tightly coupled with this cloud. Uh, you cannot easily uh, move out, you cannot move to another uh, cloud easily. So that's a problem. That's a kind of a risk called uh, window locking. Right? Um, you might heard this term. Um, yeah, that's, uh, let's look at the example. So uh, let's say we can, we want to implement a state store. Um, so for shopping, shopping cart service, how we do that? Uh, there are lots of available options. Uh, you can use Redis, you can use MongoDB, or if you use Azure, you can use CosmDB or DynamoDB in AWS. So we can assume that, uh, just to show, show example, so uh, our client has an existing solution deployed in uh, Azure, so we say, hey, let's use CosmDB, okay? Let's do it. How would we do that? So first, I'll need to read the documentation of CosmDB, uh, understand how it works, read the API, and I will install SDK. Uh, for CosmDB. Uh, if the project is developed by .NET, I need to use uh, .NET SDK, and on top of that, I'll write my logic. So it's quite straightforward, right? Um, so the change is that what if you want to host application in another cloud? What if you want to support AWS? So in that AWS, you might use uh, DynamoDB, right? There's also a NoSQL database. Or you use Redis in uh, like on-premise infrastructure. How can you do that? Um, so if you are an experienced developer, you might say, hey, let's use some design patterns like dependent injection, right? Yeah, that's a very common uh, design pattern in many solutions. So yeah, that's true. We can design the interface uh, to abstract some uh, common operations, right? Save, retrieve, and delete, something like that. And we can have different implementations, one for CosmDB, one for Redis. Um, yeah, that's that's. True, that's good, but what if you want to support more? Uh, yeah, I think maybe we can have another implementation at another like uh, dependent injection maybe configuration. So it works, but it's not good because you, you will find there are lots of duplicate code, right? Um, as a developer, we know this principle, right? Don't repeat yourself. Uh, we don't want to repeat our code. So how do we solve that? Uh, look at the state of current developers. So as developers, we want to focus on the logic, the business logic. We want to write the code, uh, just deliver our values for our custom, but I don't want to care about the infrastructure. I don't, I don't mind what DynamoDB use or use CosmDB. I don't care, just write my code, save, retrieve, delete. But the reality is, as a modern, application developer. We must learn a lot for each cloud provider. You need to learn each like API for DynamoD or CosmDB, blah, blah. So yeah, how do, we, how do we solve that? How can we write the code once and run it everywhere? How can we make our application portable? Um, I think as developer, we want to focus on the building applications and lean on uh, the cloud platform to implement the scalability or flexibility or maintainability, uh, something like that. Uh, so that's a change for our developers, right? Um, so that leads us to our um, uh, topic, uh, Depper, um, or we call it distributed application runtime. Uh, that is a new way to build your distributed application. Uh, so let's say, if you want to make the same shopping cart service, how can we make it with Depper? So that's a new diagram. So you can say, I can remove all the dependencies for DynamoDB or CosmDB or Redis. Um, we don't need that. We just call the Depper API, and Depper will call the underlying CosmDB or Redis. So that's like a abstracting la uh, layer uh, between our application and the, the cloud native service. Okay. So that says your application now is portable. If you want to support another platform, you just update the configuration of Depper and you don't need to change our, our code. That's a benefit. Um, so 
Dapper is trying to solve the complexity of building um, distributed applications. Um, here is um, overview. So you can see on the bottom row, uh, there are some cloud providers like AWS, um, Azure, and Google Cloud, Alibaba Cloud, and uh, it also supports Kubernetes or on-premise infrastructure. So in the blue area, you will see some building blocks uh, of Dapper. What is a building block? That's a new term we mentioned today. A building block is that uh, abstracting layer for a specific cloud capability. Or we can say a building block encapsulates a distributed cloud capability. For example, we mentioned state management. Um, no matter you use CosmDB or DynamoDB, both of them just NoSQL database, they have lots of similarities, right? So Dapper can make a abstraction of that, and we can access the uh, cloud native service through Dapper API. Uh, and on top of that, we can see uh, that's our application code. So application, for your application, you can use any language you like. Um, it doesn't matter because when you call Debra API, you just call the standard HTTP API or gRPC API. So that says uh, Debra can reduce the complexity. It makes our application portable. Um, also, it makes your application uh, vendor neutral. Um, so that means you don't uh, couple uh, with any specific cloud provider. Uh, for the building block, um, we have a look um, at this building block. So beside the state management, uh, we can see there are some other building blocks for service invocation or pub sub um, or uh, secret. So all of them are some common requirements when you build, uh, build a distributed application. Um, we will not introduce all of them, um, but we just understand that uh, these building blocks, Debra allows um, our application uh, can run, like you can support any platform, any cloud without having to change your code. That's uh, improvements. Um, so next question is uh, how it works. Uh, here is a Dapper architecture called Sidecar architecture. Uh, what is Sidecar? Sidecar is, on the left photo you see, um, you can see Sidecar, you can assemble it to your motorcycle, right? So Sidecar architecture allows Dapper runs in a separate process or a separate container alongside your service. So you have one service, one sidecar, one service, one sidecar. So that's called sidecar architecture. Um, and we can see um, the service calls the uh, sidecar uh, Dapper building block through the HTTP or gRPC API. And the building blocks will call the underlying component. Maybe uh, we have two now. Uh, one is Redis cache and one is service bus. Uh, so now we have a new term, component. What is component? Um, if you want to understand that, we can compare it with uh, like dependency injection we mentioned before. Uh, so in dependency injection, you know there's an interface and implementation, right? So building blocks is like the interface, okay? It's abstraction, and the component is the concrete implementation of the uh, cloud native service. So that could be easier to understand, right? Um, so that's how a uh, sidecar works. So let's say uh, the components. So Dapper has a set of components that um, support many, many popular services. Um, as we mentioned before, so state, for state stores, you can say uh, CosmDB or DynamoDB. Uh, for PubSub, you can say uh, Redis, RabbitMQ, or Service Bus. So there are more than 70 components available now. Um, the good thing is um, Dapper, because Dapper is an open source project, if you cannot find the component you need, uh, you can make a contribution, you can write the code, and contribute to the project. Uh, so that's a detail of the state management. Um, so in this example, we call, uh, we use Redis cache as a uh, component. If you want to save a state, we send a post request to the API, uh, you can see the URL is um, localhost because the, the sidecar, Dapper sidecar and your service run in the same, same um, Kubernetes pod. Uh, so you can just call localhost. Uh, and you save the state. Uh, then if you want to retrieve that, then just send a get request. 
right? Uh, if you want to support another component like uh, CosmoDB or DynamoDB, we just update the configuration file like that, so it's um, pluggable, right? Just uh, yeah, change it to another uh, implementation. Quite easy. Um, we mentioned a couple of times we can update the configuration file, so what it looks like. So that's the configuration file for Depper. Um, it's basically just a YAML file. You can configure that with your maybe Depper, uh, sorry, Docker Compose or in, in your uh, like uh, Kubernetes metadata files. Um, and you can see in the type field, we specify that as state.redis. That means the underlying component is ready. And on the left side, we can see um, there are some APIs. Um, so no matter you use Redis or CosmDB or DynamoDB, the API is all the same. Uh, we can also say some metadata here um, that specify the host name and uh, uh, secret or password. If you want to use another implementation, just update it. So look at that. The type now is CosmDB, so we can support CosmDB now. Um, you might notice that um, on the bottom, that, uh, in the middle, that there, uh, there's another field called secret key reference. Uh, because we don't, we don't need to hard code the, the password or the secret key in the uh, MFO, right? It's not safe. Uh, remember that we mentioned uh, Depper provides a secret building block to access your, your like secret management. Maybe you use keyword, Azure keyword, or like AWS use, use secret manager, right? Yeah, I don't know. So just to configure this um, secret key reference, then you can um, access the secret, so it should be safe. Um, then we have, uh, Depper also provides SDKs, because we mentioned that you can call Depper through the uh, HTTP API or gRPC API, um, but Depper also provides SDKs for many languages, because it can simplify your development. So for example, if we want to uh, get a statement, uh, get a state, we just create a Depper client and uh, call the get state async method. So it's done. It doesn't matter any database you use. You don't need to install any SDKs for DynamoDB or uh, CosmoDB. Um, just to use Depper. Um, that's a save, right? So very simple. Uh, the next thing I want to mention is that the observability. So I think from um, today's session, ma many experts mentioned the observability. So we need to uh, make sure you, your, your program uh, should send logs, right? Yeah. So Depper also provides a built-in observability building block. Um, so it can automatically intercept the traffic between the sidecars um, and send it to, uh, send it to, to uh, the, like, I'm, I'm not sure what's, uh, um, what uh, system you use, maybe Zipkin or Azure, um, Azure Apps Insights, or I know Zero use uh, New Relic. So they all use, um, Depper supports the uh, standard telemetry format called Open Telemetry. Um, so you can specify the target and you send the uh, uh, logs or um, the metrics and health checks this data to um, your target. Um, but just keep in mind that uh, Depper can just trace the traffic between the sidecars. Uh, it cannot include the uh, telemetry from your application code because apparently you need to uh, write some code to, to send the uh, telemetry from your code. You need to uh, do some additional work. Um, if we have time, we can uh, see a demo later. Um, so how do we host that? So Depper supports two kind of environments. If you do the local development, we can uh, just host it. Um, you can use the self-hosted um, mode. In this mode, uh, Depper will run in a separate process with your microservice. So basically, you can use Depper Compose, just to enable the Depper service, uh, Depper sidecars. Um, Depper also supports a Kubernetes. It's more like a production environment. Uh, you can, so normally the Docker, uh, sorry, uh, Depper sidecar will run uh, alongside your service in the same pod. Because we, we know in Kubernetes we have a pod, right? The pod, you can have um, multiple containers. So one service, one 
Dep uh, Depper sidecar, and they are in the same port. Um, yeah, the next next thing, I, I often say there's no civil bullet. I explain some benefits, but it's not perfect. Um, I think my, you might have the same question. Um, what about performance? Because if we call the, the microservice through the Depper API, that means it needs at least additional one additional network call, right? Uh, so will it impact the performance? How, how many people have, have the, this kind of question? Yeah, I, I have the same question. So I uh, checked some material uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, what I know is that the uh, Depper team has um, invested a lot on the performance um, improvements. So we mentioned that you can call Depper API through HTTP API or gRPC API. Um, anyone knows gRPC? Yeah, gRPC is um, high performance protocol. It uses a uh, binary payload, so which is much smaller than uh, JSON file in the HTTP uh, protocol. So uh, for most of the cases, um, the additional uh, overhead should be uh, negligible. So I think just a sub milliseconds. Um, but also we can, we mentioned that one, one hour application calls the uh, Depper API, um, you can use HTTP or gRPC, but it's highly recommend that you use gRPC to call Depper uh, API. So that would um, improve the performance. Um, I would not say it's perfect, but that's the trade off, right? So um, today's talk is just to say Depper is a must do. Um, it just show you some benefits, what problem it can solve. Um, just think about when you, when you develop the application, you need to understand a lot details of each cloud provider. So just think about if Depper can save your effort to solve that. If it does, then you use it, right? Um, cool, there are some um, resources. Um, you can take, take a, a photo, maybe uh, read more um, after the session. So uh, another question, we have one minute left. So another question is uh, how how do we like support some specific features for a uh, cloud service? For example, you know, DynamoD and CosmDB, even they are, uh, both of them are no SQL database. There must be some difference, right? Maybe this service support one uh, feature A, this service supports feature B. How can we do that in Depper? So that's a tricky thing, because uh, Depper is like, uh, abstracting layer just for some common operations. It just uh, abstracts the most common operations. It cannot support all the features for each platform because it's impossible, right? So just think about your scenarios. If you need to use a very specific feature in this cloud, then that not, uh, might not be your case. Um, but it does solve some uh, common uh, requirements. Uh, okay, we have just 30 seconds left, so really appreciate that. Um, thank you very much. Um, I like this Lego photo, yeah. Cool, thank you very much, yeah. Mm -hmm.